Welcome to topic number 133 this uh, evening and uh, we are going to be covering a topic called grace versus legalism. For those that are dialing in, you are welcome to join us. This is a Generation Impact Bible College and I'm Pastor Leslie Hessel and uh, we're going to basically cover this topic with our students tonight. But for anybody that's dialing in to Facebook or any other of the social media platforms, welcome. So as we prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord, let's just pray and trust God for an impartation this evening. Father, we thank you for this opportunity just to be able to come together once again. And Father, to receive your word, Father, as your word gets uh, comes into our hearts, Lord, we pray that it lands on fertile ground, and because it does that, it bears forth much fruit, and it becomes beneficial not only to the hearer, but also to that one that speaks. So, Father God, we thank you for the word that is yea and amen, it's trusted, it's a foundation, it is what we base our lives on, Lord, in Jesus' name. So we give you all the glory, honor, and praise for everything that will be achieved this evening, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And as more people sign on right now, again, this is... Generation Impact Bible College, and we are busy with topic 133, and uh, the title for this topic is Grace versus Legalism. And uh, we know that everything in the Christian walk is originated and based from Greek, um, the, uh, from grace, sorry. The Greek word for grace is charis, and uh, it is known as God's favor, God's um, uh, mercy, God's for, uh, goodness towards you and I, and we know that absolutely everything that we live, everything that we do, everything that we experience, once we come into a relationship with God, is based on His grace uh, towards us. So, definition and grace is God's unmerited favor. Um, some people go further to say undeserved, and uh, therefore we understand that word favor as such. Legalism is a man's effort to get something. That is where your and my works and toils come into the picture. That's when you and I try in our own strength to be able to do something. So the word grace, however, is used in the Bible to refer to all that God is, uh, to all that God is. Free to do for mankind because of the work that has already been performed for us by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. So it looks at the work that was accomplished on the cross and we know that we are saved through grace and not through works. Grace means that man has received from God that which he has not earned or deserved. And uh, nothing that we are and nothing that we can do is enough to qualify us for anything that the Lord has given to us. In fact, our works cause us to be arrogant in the presence of God, something he will not tolerate. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 reads as follows. It says, but we are like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like faulty rags. We, are, we all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. God the Father does the work. Man receives the benefit. God receives the glory for his own works. Man receives no glory. That's why we don't draw any attention or glory unto ourselves, but we allow everything to go back to our Father, the Lord, and to Lord Jesus Christ as we, um, enter into a relationship with him and live the life that he's purposed and planned for us. Okay, so when we look at grace, then there's, there's four main categories or types. Um, I prefer to look at it as the types of grace. Uh, the first one is common grace, uh, or grace which is common to all mankind, saved or unsaved, such as rain which falls on the just and unjust. So in other words, there's things that, are, that we all benefit from, okay, irrespective of whether you have come into a relationship with God or not, and because of that, you, you have that. Then there's saving grace, the gift of God, lest any man should boast, all right? And uh, namely, grace applied to the lost sinner. So we receive uh, God's unmerited favor and grace because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because of that, it's a gift from God to us. We find that also in Romans chapter 5, where it talks about that. Then the third type is living grace, the provision of God the Father for the needs of the believer for the rest of his life, God provides everything that is needed for for a prosperous, happy life for any believer who has tasted grace and avails himself of more grace. So we understand and know then that that as we live our lives, God has made a way. He's already prepared the plan. We enter into it and we come into a, a understanding thereof and apply it to our lives through faith in God and through faith in the word of God, applying the word to ourselves, renewing our minds with that word, allowing ourselves to meditate on it on a daily basis. Then we have surpassing grace. 
the grace of God in eternity that we will receive from God because of salvation. What we will receive from God as crowns or rewards to be laid at the feet of Christ. That's obviously once the return of Jesus comes. According to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7. The nations come to you might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So, so therefore, because of what Christ did on the cross once again, once this time here on this earth comes to an end and we enter into eternity, which the Bible speaks about, then there is surpassing grace. There is grace that is way beyond your and my imagination. We can't even conceptualize, we can't even visualize, we can't even imagine what is to come after this time, anything that you and I might think about, anything you and I might dream about, anything you and I might think about, will fall forced, far short sorry, from that which we will achieve when we come into eternity one day. We do not understand and know through our natural minds exactly what God has prepared for us. That is surpassing grace. That is grace going into the future, past um, this dispensation of time. When time comes to the end, we enter into eternity. All right, then we've got examples of living grace. Remember, that's the third one we spoke about, that grouping. That is what benefits you and I here on earth right now as we live our lives. This is a provision that God has made. This is a preparation that God has made. This is what Jesus purchased and paid a price for on the cross so that you and I could enter into this. This is quite a lengthy list, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through them and um, maybe not pick up absolutely everything in the scripture, but we'll highlight one or two for you. The first one is grace and God's acceptance, Ephesians 1, six, To the praise of the glory of His grace by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. You know, that's such an amazing truth just there. If you can, if you can receive and understand that God loved the world so much that He actually made a way for us through Jesus. Now we are already seen as His beloved because we know that John 3.16, well known verse of scripture, makes a uh, declaration and makes a, the, the statement that for God so loved the world. Alright, and we understand that He, that every human being out there, whether saved or unsaved, God loves them. And because of that, God yearns for them to come back into a relationship with Him. And therefore, he, he, he woos them. That's the word I'm looking for. He woos them on a continuous basis to bring them into a relationship with Him. So therefore, in because of God's grace, um, we are able to come into that place and we are all accepted because of that. Then secondly, grace is in confidence. Uh, grace in confidence in God's plan. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. So our hope is established because of the grace that's been extended to us through, through God. Grace in prayer, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So so you and I have got entrance into the, the very throne room of God. We can come into His presence and because of His grace, because of His unmerited favor, because of what he's, the mercy is extended to us, we are, and His kindness included, we can push in and we can even come into a place where we can even be in His presence and be able to pray and, and uh, when there is a need in our lives, be able to bring our supplications before Him. Then there's grace in daily provision. God meets God. If you are prepared to believe God, God will prepare, will provide for your needs. Uh, we see that in uh, Psalm 84 verse 11. We also see that in Romans 8:32, and there's many other scriptures as well. It talks about daily provision, even the Lord's, uh, the Lord's prayer, uh, Matthew chapter six, I think it is, and Luke 11. Uh, I'm not sure, but Matthew chapter six definitely um, it talks about the Lord's prayer, and we know that the, it says that. Uh, we pray in that prayer that the Lord will may meet our daily needs. So, so we know that there's grace in daily provision for us, and we pray for that in a continuous basis. Grace in suffering, all right? And he, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10 says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, in needs, in persecutions and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So in other words, 
when you and I, that don't make some grace is sufficient for you or to you, means that God has made provision for absolutely everything. So whenever trials and tribulations come, whenever things happen, in the circumstance, in the situation, you and I can believe God that He will not allow us to be tested or tried beyond that which we can handle. And if that should happen, He will make a way out. You find that in the book of Corinthians. And because of that, we are made, it's possible for us then to live the life that Christ has provided for us. And His grace is therefore sufficient in that situation that we can actually deal with and handle suffering. And when we do suffer, when trials and tribulations do come, then James puts it this way. He says, count it all joy, because it builds patience and endurance in the things of the Lord, that you can exercise your faith, that God will meet you in that situation, and in your weakness, you will become strong. If you can get a revelation of that and get an understanding of that God will never leave you nor forsake you. He is always with you. All right. That he will never allow you to, to, to be destroyed. If you and I can just get into a place where we trust him and believe him and put our faith and our confidence in him. Next one. Grace in God's patience with us. Psalm 103 verse 8. The Lord is merciful and graceful, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. All right, so we uh, we see his grace and his mercy and his kindness abound to us because of what he has done. Grace and next one, grace and releasing the power of God. Two Timothy two one. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Our confidence is in Christ. We operate in the name of Jesus. We know and understand that through his uh, sacrifice on the cross we can enjoy and enter into everything that has been purposed and planned for us. Great. Next one, grace in victory over sin. Romans 6.14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Grace entered in when Christ was manifest on this earth, His first coming. When He went to the cross and He died and He shed His blood for you and I, that is when the grace was manifest. And we entered into a, a dispensation or an era of grace. Before that, they were under the dispensation or the era of law. Moses' uh, the Mosaic covenant as, a, as it's described. We have come under a new covenant. And because of the new covenant, we enjoy the benefits of the grace and mercy of God because of what Jesus did. We cannot overemphasize what Jesus did, because it's what he did on the cross, that his blood was able to deal with sin and wash away the effect of sin. And therefore, your and my sins, not what re uh, uh, retards or, or stops us from coming into heaven, because the moment we accept Christ, our sin is dealt with through the blood. It is only unbelief in what Jesus did that's going to prevent you and I from ever getting into heaven. So while you believe and I believe, we have got a door that's been opened. We can come into the throne room of God with boldness. And because of that, we can enjoy the benefits of the grace. So therefore, we have victory over sin. Sin no more has dominion over us. You do not live a sinful life. You live a life after Christ because of what He has done for you. Your desire is not to sin. We might fall. There might be things that happen from time to time. But we are quick to repent quick to come to God for forgiveness, get up and enjoy the fullness of the victory that God has provided for us over sin. Grace and spiritual growth. Next point, 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We, if, if you do not have an understanding of the grace of God, it is vital that you, are, you press into the Word of God. Understand and learn about His grace, but at the same time, encounter God in his, your relationship with Him. Remember, we do not serve a form or dead God. We serve a living God who is actively uh, influencing, is part of, uh, related to, in our lives all the time, because He has chosen to make us His temple. He has chosen to come and live big in us. And because He has done that, he inhabits this very physical body as his temple. He has chosen to move out of a, a brick and mortar building into 
flesh and blood and to live big inside of us. Therefore, we have the benefit that if we know and understand uh, what grace is and we learn more about grace, it will change your life never to be the same again. You and I have to come into that place where we learn more and more about Christ every single day. We learn more and more about who He is and who we are in Him so that we can live the life that He has purposed for us. Not for our own benefit and, and, and saying, hey, listen, look at me, look at my life. No, it's so that we can fulfill the kingdom mandate that God has given us on this earth. Because we need to live out the life that is purposed for us. This dispensation, this era, this church age, as it's referred to, will come to an end according to scripture. And when it does come to end, we will enter into a new dispensation. And ultimately we will end up in eternity with Christ. And that is what we need to understand. And we need to grow in this grace. Not only in grace from God to us, but also in grace from us to the people around about us. Because just as God extends His grace to you and I, so we need to extend grace, favor, kindness, mercy to those that are around about us. All right? None of us have deserved it. None of us have earned it. And therefore, we have to share it with everybody else. Next point. Grace in spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. We need to understand that everyone has been given giftings in various areas, spiritual giftings. And because of that, not one of us are the same. God has given some more of one and less of other. In other words, let me give you a simple one. Uh, if we look at just normal common grace, um, the ability to, to sing. All right. I am by no stretch of the imagination a vocalist or a singer. Therefore, people will run away from me rather than coming to me when I try and do that. But then there are others that are blessed with beautiful voices that sound like angels out of heaven themselves when they minister and they sing. And those are gifts that are given one to another. But then there are gifts that other people have that are different. And that is what makes us different one to another. And we have to understand then that even spiritual gifts, that is a common grace, common gift. But if you look at spiritual gifts, the same thing applies. Prophecy, um, tongues, interpretation of tongues, all these things. Um, there are different giftings gift un given unto men. And we all enter into some of those giftings. And some have more of one and less of the other, etc., etc. Next one. Grace and stability. By Sylvanus, 1 Peter 5 verse 12 says, By Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I considered him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. All right, so we anchored, we are stability, <coughs> excuse me, is in the grace of God. And that is what we, where our foundation is. Because our hope and our confidence, as we read earlier, is where we, is built on that stability in Christ, in that grace of the Lord. Grace in becoming gracious, 2 Corinthians 8, 19. And not only that, but who has also chosen by the church to travel with us, with his gift, which is administered by us, to the glory of the Lord himself, and to show your ready mind. Next one, grace in method of living. Grace in method of living. Um, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptable with reverence and godly fear. Next one. Grace in worship of God. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. All right? When you've got grace in your heart, you have got mercy, love, kindness, uh, favor towards the Lord, and you sing with that, and you bring an attitude of worship Towards him, grace in the production of divine good. 1 Corinthians 15 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than you all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20 Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for the necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Grace is there for us to 
to bring good into this world. As we show the love of God and the grace of God towards us, when we speak words of grace and of love and of kindness to others, and we demonstrate and show His grace towards the world, that becomes an attraction for them to come to, to, to live the life that God has purposed for us and make a commitment come into a relationship with Him. So let's have a look at one, two things quickly. Those are, that's a list of some of the, um, uh, the living graces that we spoke about early on, a whole a bunch of examples in the Bible, which really talks about what God has done for you and I to be able to live here on earth today. God has made provision for His children, for those that believe in Him, His family, to live a life um, that is uh, that is favor, uh, it's, it's productive, um, it is happy, there's uh, provision, um, etc., etc. And all those graces are there. You and I need to study the Word of God and learn the Word of God and get to know these graces and understand what we are, that what we have in Him. And because of that, we do not have to accept anything substandard or lower than what the word is already imparted and given to us. So now the next section talks about abuses of grace. We do understand that there's been a season over the last couple of years where there's been, um, let me put it this way, like hyper grace. And I do believe that that's allowed for some abuses from some sectors on this topic of grace. But no doubt that grace is vital. Grace is, is, is critical. Grace abounds to you and I. There's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. But we do also need to understand that there are people that have taken advantage of it and we need to bring the balance. So let's have a look quickly. First, grace is sometimes taken to mean that it is permissible to sin. All right? Thus, grace is used as an excuse for licentiousness. This is always condemned by the Word of God. All right? You cannot use grace as an excuse to just do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, however you want to do it. Paul, when he spoke in the book of Romans, he actually spoke about the fact that there are things that are permissible and acceptable um, to an individual because of grace, but the minute that you use that, and it becomes a stumbling block to somebody else, that becomes a problem. All right? And we need to understand then that when we use grace as a, as a license to be able to do things that, that are maybe borderline, um, we need to understand that it could be an obstacle to other people. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why we then abuse and make grace a li use licentiously. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, in verse 2. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? You see, when you've died to sin through the blood of Jesus, sin no longer has power over you or should not have power over you. And because of that, why would you want to live in sin any longer? Why would you want to go to stuff that Jesus paid the price for? that he gave his life for, that he went to the cross for, why would you want to do that? There is no pleasure, no joy in that, because that is going to ultimately lead to death, because the wages of sin is death. Total separation from God. There is no logic or even sense in pursuing a sinful uh, lifestyle, or lifestyle where I say everything is like, is, 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 um, acceptable and okay, and thereby testing the boundaries of God's grace and walking close to the cliff edge, so to speak. Who would want to do that? No, we understand the grace of God. We shun sin. We do not uh, partake in sin. We do not treat grace as a license to sin. We don't entertain sin in any form, shape, or size whatsoever. In 1 John 1 verse 9 it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jude 1.4 says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we do not entertain sin. We do not bring sin into the picture. 
We do not take grace as a license to sin. And uh, sin is not permissible in any form, shape or size whatsoever. Secondly, grace is sometimes taken as a permission to be lazy. Especially to skip Bible study. This idea violates all Bible commands to study. All right. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 through 12 says, And we desire that each one of you shall show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. First, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. But also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith and virtue, faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. 2 Peter 10, uh, 1 verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And we know there's many other scriptures that tell us that we need to spend time in the Word of God, that we need to change our thinking. We need to come into a closer relationship with Him. We understand that many, many scriptures that teach us that and show us that, and we cannot let that by the wayside. There is a demand, there's a command from God that you and I continuously on a daily basis need to press in closer and closer to Him, get to know Him better and better every moment, become more like Him every single moment of the day as we pursue Him in every facet and part of our lives. We need to allow the Holy Spirit in to do a work inside of us to change us so that we can become effective in the call and the function that God has called us to. So we need to understand then that it's, it's a priority that we, we study the Word of God, learn the Word of God. What a lot of people have done with grace, they use it as a permission to slack off in their study of the Word and they're building their relationship with God. So therefore, they, the attitude is, um, I can live whichever way I want to live. It uh, doesn't matter. Because I accepted Christ as a one-time act, it's good enough, it's fine. I don't have to concern myself. I'm okay. That is also violating all Bible and all commands to study that we need to bring into play in our daily lives. So, that is a, we've already taken most of our time for this particular session. So let me quickly go on to legalism then. So grace is a vast topic. We can spend many hours talking about grace, especially if you delve into scripture and you get to every one of those scriptures, you unpack them. It's a very, it's an amazing topic and you need to do that. And you need to understand that you are in grace with God. But legalism is exactly the opposite. That is based on the Mosaic covenant, the law. And uh, grace depends solely on the character of God and entirely excludes human ability, human merit, human achievement, etc. Legalism, however, depends on human activity and ability. So in other words, you are the one that, that does everything. Okay. Whereas with grace, it is dependent on what God has already done for us and it's based on his, his character and who he is. Our human system of work and rewards is like this. I work for you and you pay me. We add on to what God has done and not allow Him to flow through us. The word legalism also refers to any merit system which operates by works by which a person tries to please God or to assist God or to glorify God by human power. There are four principal spiritual transactions in which works are not accepted by God. Salvation, spirituality, maturity and reward. Okay, so in other words, <clears throat> if you look at those things, your salvation is by grace, not by your works and by my works. You aren't, you cannot earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God. So therefore, it's 100% God, 0% you. All you and I do is accept it by faith and receive it into our lives and start living according to the way the word instructs us to live. Honoring the commands and the, and the teachings that Jesus gave us. Secondly, spirituality. Spirituality is totally a non-human work. The minute you start working on spirituality yourself, you are getting away from God's mandate. You're getting involved in areas and things that is not godly. And because of that, you are going to get involved in demonic influences and all kinds of other stuff that is, that is not of God and therefore could land to spiritual death. Then you've got maturity. We grow in maturity with God. All right. So therefore, 
It's not something that you and I work on. It's not something that you and I try and, and, and say, oh, I'm mature today. No. Maturity comes by becoming wise in the things of the Lord, becoming uh, understanding Scripture, being able to apply Scripture well, getting the wisdom of God into your life so that your life can become a, a reflection of who God is. And when people look at you, they don't see you, but they see Christ in you. And then the reward. We know and understand that, the, that here on earth, as we read a little bit earlier on, um, the worldly system is you work, you get, uh, you get a reward and you get paid. We understand that in the Genesis chapter 3, if you look at the curse that was uh, brought upon the world and upon the ground, that uh, God made the statement that man will not receive um, from the from the ground as it was in the Garden of Eden, but now you would have to toil and work, and the gra- ground will be cursed because of thorns and thistles and all those kinds of things. And now it became all effort, all work. But Jesus brought us back to a place through His grace that we can now enter into this place where we can enjoy the benefits of God's provision and what God has provided right from the beginning. So therefore. When we look at the rewards, our rewards come not because of our effort, not because of what we do, but it's our relationship with God. And it comes through the sowing and reaping principle, because that is God's principle. Look at creation right around you. It's all got to do with sowing and reaping. Um, nothing out there um, has to labor to grow. Everything you sow a seed, the seed nourishes itself from the ground and from the rain and from the water and from the air and then grows and develops into maturity and comes to a place where you then have benefit from the fruit that, that it produces. So the rewards come because of giving and because of sowing and not because of man's effort and because of what you are doing. So examples of legalism then in our example, in our, in our uh, salvation will be like this. We believe and we keep the law of Moses. All right, so basically what we do is we believe God. We say, yes, Lord, we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. But now we try and live out the commands as per Moses' law. So we go and study all the laws and now we try and make it a legal thing. And we try and enforce all those mosaic laws on individuals. Whereas grace abounds to us. We do not practice that because remember, Jesus didn't come to... Uh, destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. All right. So in him. So in other words, give me, give me, let me give you an example. In in the uh, Ten Commandments, it says you shall not kill. All right. That stands even today. You don't kill. But the the final law, the or the great commandment today is love God, love man, love as you love yourself. That's Leslie's paraphrase. And because of that love, you will not murder. You will not steal. You will not do all the, the sinful things, which are contained within the Mosaic law. Therefore, it is fulfilled. All right. And we need to therefore understand that people that go back to trying in, to implement the, the law, Paul tried to put it this way. He says, you can't, if you're going to try and do the law, you've got to do the law. But if you're going to do grace, do grace. All right. And we choose to do grace. Because we cannot do the law. If we could do the law, then there would have been no need for Jesus to come in the first place. All right. So we need to understand then that legalism is one of the ways that you can you can uh, implement it or use it in your life is by keeping the law of Moses. Second one, uh, being circumcised. All right. Because remember, there was the uh, the need within. The Jewish custom and culture, according to the Old Testament, where eight days after a, child, a man child was born, uh, he would get circumcised. All right, and that was what they did. That was required by the law to do that. Circumcision is no longer quite required today because we live under grace. Third one, confession of your sins. All right. Now, in in the in the Old Testament and in the in the time of the law, there was the need to to for sin to be dealt with because sin had not yet been dealt with by the cross by the blood of Jesus and therefore there were sacrifices forms of sacrifices the uh, there was the scapegoat there was atonement all these things had to be done on a ritually basis once a year uh, the high priests were involved etc etc and then you had to deal with that sin that sin had to be confessed um, through sacrifice or dealt with through sacrifice and all those things today the ultimate sacrifice has happened Jesus has already been gone to the cross he shed his blood he's dealt dealt with sin once and for all all we have to do is receive the gift we have to believe what Jesus did was a perfect work and our sin 
sin has been dealt with. Um, next one, give up your bad habits and fully surrender. I think that is one of the biggest issues that we have um, in life today. Is that people try and make themselves better. In other words, if I'm struggling with certain things in my life, I'll try and do through a program of works, I try and improve myself. Some people will even say, um, I won't accept Christ now purely because I can't come to Him as I am. I first need to shape up and fix certain things in my life. Once I've done that, then I can come. All that is a liar from the devil. All right, You and I come as we are. Our habits, our bad habits, our, our the things that we do that are not well pleasing unto God, the way we do it is to surrender to God, fully surrender. And that by doing that, we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and we surrender to Him and we allow Him to do the perfect work. And as He deals with issues in our lives, you will find that those bad habits will start fading away and suddenly disappear. If you look at your life six months or a year down the road, you'll find that those things that you were doing, you were no longer doing. Because by allowing the Holy Spirit into your life and surrendering to God, He comes and He helps you through His grace to deal with those issues and those problems. Um, make a public display or have great sorrow over a show of tears. Okay, that is going into the public place, the public square, and trying to show your how great you are and how much of a spiritual person you are and, and all those kinds of things. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a program of work. You're trying to curry favor. You're trying to work favor from people around about. You're trying to show them. No, don't do that. Because God, your gifts will make way for you. God will promote you when it's necessary. So you and I can relax, chill, enjoy life, enjoy good relationship with God, allow His grace to abound and work in our lives. And we do not have to make it public display. We allow the Lord to promote us and take us to where we need to go. And then obviously the, there's other r- religious habits, okay, that, that people have that they need to break, which, which are where they force people to do certain things and live a certain lifestyle. Um, those things all become legalistic. And they legalism and they put people into bondage. And I think that's the biggest threat or the biggest downside of legalism is that it robs the believer of their freedom. All right. And it puts them into bondage. Grace liberates. Um, The life of God liberates. They give us freedoms beyond your wildest dreams. Even when this physical body might have been restrained or kept into captivity or certain freedoms taken away. God can never take, oh sorry, man can never take all your freedoms away. Those freedoms that God has given you, you will always have. So therefore, even if you're in a prison cell, like Paul was, he was still free even where he was confined because of the grace of God that abounded to him and that was part of his life. So the gospel is believing in God and adding nothing to it, allowing God through his grace to bound in your life and work in your life and complete the work that he has started. He says that he is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the one that builds you and I up. And therefore, we trust him and we believe in him. Uh, we've run out of time. We <clears throat> So I'll deal with questions and answers later. But praise God. Let's just close in prayer. And then I'm going to release you guys. Uh, Pastor Connie will be on next. Father, we just thank you for this evening. And we thank you for this opportunity to receive your word. Father, I know that I rush through these things. And Father God, there's much truth in grace and what you have done and, and, and purpose for us on the cross. So Father God, tonight we love you. We glorify you. We exalt you. We thank you above everything, Father, for what you did on the cross through Jesus and shedding the precious blood of Jesus so that we might receive the grace of God into our lives. Lord, let the people receive a revelation of your love and of your grace that abounds to them and the freedom that is purchased and paid for, Lord, that we can walk in. So we now release your people, Lord, and we ask you to keep your, your head above them and over them in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Hallelujah.